if I want to go take a vacation right now to a nice place, you know, I can without having to worry about it. If I want to go work remotely, I can go get a job that works remotely. Mm-hmm. Like right now, it's just a choice to work hybrid. Mm. Um, and I know for a fact that I can get a job just because of my skill set and how, you know, how valuable I am in the market. Um, just, just grateful for that. You know, my child, she's growing up much better than I did. Um, and I enjoy seeing that and just her not having to have, worry about those stressors, you know, that could happen from the day to day. She just gets to run around and be happy and free and whatever. She don't even know how good she has it. <laughs> that's a blessing. And, that, and that's what we do it for, right? Exactly. And that's why I started this whole series is because I want people to know that even though we didn't start out with money, you mm-hmm. know, you can get into tech, live a great life. Um, start investing, start saving your money, and then set your yourself up and your future generations up. Mm-hmm. 100% agree. Welcome back to another episode of Day in My Tech Life. My name is Simone B, also known as B. So if you're new here, make sure you follow and leave a comment. But today we have a very, very special guest. This is Kiara Dotson. She is a cloud DevOps and a site reliability engineer. So welcome on to the show, Kiara. I'm super excited to have you because I've known you for years. Yeah, yeah. It's been like, what, six, seven years now? The, yeah. yeah, that's what you're saying. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, man, time flies. Yeah, since like, what, 20? 18 2017 yeah that's when we, we we officially met in miami oh yeah yeah, yeah. So you did yeah. come to my birthday party yes <laughs> yep yeah. that was a crazy time we yeah. gotta run that back but yeah thank <laughs> you for having me yes no thank you for coming out so um i want i want people to know like you know what's your background where are you from and like what made you want to get interested in the tech yeah sure sure so i'm actually from houston originally from houston i grew up uh and basically, third and uh, fifth ward. And mm-hmm. I don't know if y'all know about that, but it's Houston. That's like where the hood is. Mm. So I grew up around those parts of areas. We moved over a lot of times. I think we ended up settling in Spring Branch by the time I was ready to go to high school. Um, and I just knew from a very young age, I did not want to be stuck. I did not like not having money at mm. all. I did not like, you know, just having to try and struggle to make ends meet. So I had to figure it out. So basically, I was a band kid. But there were a lot of students there that were well off. Mm -hmm. Like one of my best friends, her dad was a petroleum engineer engineer Mm -hmm. in the UK. And I remember one time his mom had pulled out her app, like her checking app or her bank account app. (laughs) And I like accidentally looked over her shoulder. I was just chilling. But I saw 100K in the checkings. And I was like... (laughs) What I didn't even know that it existed. Like, right, how do right. you have like just checkings alone? Yeah. So I was like, like how much is in the savings? Yeah. So I was like, whatever y'all own, I need to figure out and be on too. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, well, college, because that's clearly how you know their father became an engineer. So I was like, I gotta go to college. I'll figure it out how to make it somehow. But somehow, my college is where the money is at. Yeah. Because um, most of my people and my family they didn't go to school, like college and stuff like that. Yeah. So about the time where it was time to, you know, graduate, go to school and stuff, I just Googled, you know, highest paying degrees, whatever, whatever, whatever. I see something called computer science. They say it only takes four years. Okay, bet. I'm over here. I thought it was literally like Apple Store where you like trying to open apps and stuff for old people. I had no idea what coding was. I was like, okay, great. I know how to do this. I'd be helping my grandma and my mom all the time open Mm -hmm. up apps and stuff like that. (sighs) <sighs> yeah <laughs> look i went through the same thing like my dad was like don't do it when you go to college do computer science i'm like i don't know what programming is got in that class i'm like what is this this is yeah. not nah this is not what i signed up for yeah but i was here and i was like okay this makes six figures i guess this is what i gotta do right exactly so i was like sign me up so i ended up actually going to ut i applied to ut and a and m um just because those seem to be the top schools that all the well-to-do people like my peers were going to so i was like okay great those are my only options um i made sure to be in the top 10 too i mm-hmm. think at that time for ut they were only accepting top seven percent so i just was like i just got to study 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 and stay in band that way i can make sure i don't do anything that jeopardizes any opportunities to get to school mm-hmm. so yeah like you said go to ut first day of class they talk about four loops Hey, it took me a whole year and a half to understand for loops and while loops. I'm like, I don't, I don't get it. Yes. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. This is not opening up Microsoft Excel. Yeah. Like, what do you, what do you mean? And so because I was confused, I took myself to office hours just mm-hmm. to go ask I me mean, like, Hey, could you like break this down better? I don't understand. 
the teacher told me, oh, well, since you don't understand it as cliviture and logical enough, you should switch majors. You're not going to make it. Like, straight up to my face. He didn't even give me a chance to, like... Teach. Like, yeah, you didn't yeah. even try to, like, teach you, give you a chance exactly. to learn. Yeah, no, same thing happened to me. I was like, I don't understand this. And they're like, no, there's no way you're going to finish this degree right. if you don't understand, like, the first or second classes of, of uh, uh, I think it was, like, Programming 101. Mm -hmm. They're like, if you don't understand this, you're not going to make it. And I think that's something that, that happens a lot for black students and minorities yes. when it comes to people who are trying to get into either engineering or computer science or cybersecurity. They automatically like count us out just because of the fact that we don't understand the initial classes. But a lot of us weren't exposed in high school. So seeing it in college is the first time we saw it. Agreed. Agreed. So like you said, yeah, he didn't even give me a chance to even understand or grasp the material. And then it's even crazier because I'm like, this is like the first or second class day. You're not even trying to teach. This is literally your job. This is what we're paying all these all this money for you to do. But that pissed me off. It pissed me off bad because well, I do not like people telling me no. And I don't like telling pe people telling me what I can't do. Mm. So I ended up... Um, I think I ended up dropping that class and then taking it again the next semester. With a different, like, um, mm -hmm. professor. And I, and I yeah. ran straight And, and sometimes it. that's all it is. It's like, it's a bad professor. Horrible professor. Yeah. It was, he was really horrible, and there's nothing that we could do because he's, he's tenured. Mm. So when a lot of professors are tenured, they know that they basically can't get kicked out because they've just had so much longevity with the um, college. So they just tend to just talk any type of way to people. But mm. I made it. Um, it was still quite a struggle. I didn't realize it. Um, I knew that UT Austin was a really great school. I just didn't realize what that would require of me, especially with someone of my background. My peers were people who literally had to create their first app in the Apple Store before their parents would allow them to get um, an iPhone. Oh, wow. Yeah. I literally had somebody, like, literally one of my good friends at that time. They're like, nah. Other people were directors of Google and, like, the Salesforce and all that stuff like that. So they had exposure to this since they were children. Mm. Meanwhile, I don't even know what a for loop is, you know? <laughs> it's, it's tough for us. Yeah. It's tough for us. We're, like, we're very far behind the, the eight ball once we get started. But the main thing is that I want everybody to know is that it's challenging, but you just mm -hmm. cannot give up, right? As right. long as you put in the work, put in the time, put in the effort, it will eventually click one day. Like, right. I promise you, like, one day is going to click. Yep, absolutely. And that's exactly what happened. So, yeah, I did not give up. I just knew that I was going to figure it out, and one day I was going to run laps around my peers. And that's exactly what I did. So a lot of my professors were seeing me at office hours 24-7 just so I can make sure to grasp the material. And if it even wasn't that, I have a mouthpiece on me. So if people see me and I talk to them, they just get comfortable with me being around them. So them seeing me often kind of already gives them a good reputation of me. So that actually helped with passing classes and understanding um, everything like that. Also, I know it sounds weird or like completely ironic, but I would take off class just to study <laughs> And sometimes you have to go to YouTube University because sometimes those people on those YouTube videos would teach better than your actual teachers. That helped a lot too. Um, I fell into some health issues. I actually have an autoimmune disorder mm. and that messed me up a lot because I was really trying to figure out what was going on with that super rare condition and nobody could really understand what, how to fix it or what to solve. So that kind of jeopardized my studies. I almost got kicked out my second year. I had to petition to stay in, which is like only... I think 8% of people that petitioned at that time actually got to stay in the program wow. when they were on risk to get out. But um, I had to file a case, submit you know, all my doctor history and stuff like that. They let me stay in. I Granted, I just had to get a B, and I think it was the operating systems class. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I <laughs> That class is challenge too. It was, yes. It's I like, feel like the entire <laughs> computer science curriculum is just hard. Like, it does not get easier until you're like, halfway into your junior year where facts. you're like almost done that's facts and that <laughs> you're still trying to like swim forward it's yeah. like you're swimming against a wave that's mm -hmm. really what it is oh my goodness and so just tough. when you feel like you understand something it like another wave comes but um you just keep going because i think it's just it's a skill it's like repetition the more you study and practice and do things the more it clicks together I mean, I've been doing this for, what, seven years now, officially, like, full-time, and I'm just now understanding concepts that I had learned just back then. Just wow. because, you know, just trying to put the pieces together of how software works, you know, especially when it comes to businesses and what their requirements are and their needs. So it's a lot. Yeah. A lot of people think that they have to know everything immediately 
off the bat. But no, it takes time. Just let it sit in, let it marinate, and it's okay. I promise eventually you'll get it. Um, and yeah, that's just, that's honestly how life goes. That's with any role, even if it's, you know, technical, non-technical. There's just so many aspects of a job or your work that you're doing that you really just have to um, take the time to just let it kick in and understand it. Yeah, but no, definitely. So, so while you were at school at UT, did you get like any internships while you were there? Yes. So I think after, so after going into sophomore year or junior so freshman year summer, no, I did not. Mm -hmm. But I did get to see all my peers go to the Facebooks and the Googles and stuff like that. That lit a fire under me to where the next year, I think going into junior year, I got to get my first internship. And that was actually with um, a local defense contracting company in Austin. Oh, yeah. And that was dope. I actually got to be in the R&D department. Oh, oh, so you were doing all the fun stuff. <laughs> yes, it was interesting. But what made it even cooler was before I got that offer, I was literally working between three different call center jobs. Wow. I got fired from one of them. It was actually the UT call center where yeah. they make you call, like, mm -hmm. you know, the past students or the alum, uh, alumni and call and beg for money. Yeah, and yeah. I didn't like that. I don't like begging for money to yeah, begin yeah. with. So I'm about to do that. <laughs> Um, another one was also other two call centers. They were the ones where you fill out your number, like the win a car or something like oh, that. Yeah, and they yeah. sell your money or sell your numbers yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, I hated them. Mm. So as soon as I got that offer, I was like, yeah, sign me up. But yeah. like you said, it was super cool. That first, I learned a lot actually um, in that first internship. I actually got to do some software engineering or front end engineering. And then I also got to do some mobile app development mm. for, um, for Android. Oh, okay. And what what was the name of this defense contractor? So this was um so this was all this was the Austin um I for, actually I forgot off the top of my head. Oh, okay. I can't so remember. Good. I could probably remember it later. Yeah, yeah. For some reason it just slipped my mind. Yeah, that's okay. But the, yeah, but they were definitely in Austin. It was a smaller one, but they've been around for forever. Yeah. It's probably be easy to just look and look it up, but you know, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's dope. So do you remember how much they had paid you at the time for your first internship? Yeah, it was actually, it was like on the lower end for sure, but mm. I think it was 20, 25 bucks. Um, they wanted to give me lower, but I negotiated. Yeah. Always negotiate no matter what. Um, because a lot of people, especially when it's your first internship or they know that's your first job or whatever, they will try and play you. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you don't have experience or anything like that. Well, if you like me enough to hire me, then clearly you see I have some type of value. So Right. I mean, I'm going to ask, I'm going to test that. I'm yeah. going to test it. I'm going to ask it for more. Yeah. And they gave me more. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So from that first internship, like, where did you go from there? Because that was your junior year. Did you get another one your senior or did the next job, was that your first, like, full-time role? So, no, I actually got another one. So actually, after that summer, I continued that um, the government contracting internship mm -hmm. into the following fall semester. And um, and then also the next summer, I actually interned at Visa. Oh, okay. I actually got that one from a Nesby conference. Hey, shout out to Nesby. Nesby. Love Nesby. They love, really love be Nesby. Out. People, I don't know when this episode is going to come out, but if you have not heard of Nesby, National Society of Black Engineers, you definitely need to find your local chapter, um, whether you're in, in high school, college, or you're a professional, find your mm -hmm. local chapter and get active, right? And definitely go to the national convention as well. I'll be, I think I'll be speaking there, the CEO of Nesby, shout out to Janine. She wants me to come and speak. So it's, yeah. it's people got to go. Like it's just, Nesby has so many opportunities Thanks. and people sleep on it. Like you will get jobs on the spot. Mm -hmm. And the way that Nesby is ran is how I want my conference to be ran. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you know, cause I know you're not on Twitter as much anymore. Yeah. If you even, I don't even know if you're on Twitter anymore. For the past month, I've been off. So okay, okay, in. yeah. So, <laughs> so like basically the way the way GovTechCon is going to be ran is December 18th to December 20th is similar way to Nesby, right? We're going to have the different government um, contractor companies and the government agencies, and we'll have a space where people can do interviews on the spot. Mm -hmm. So you know, the goal is to get people jobs on the spot. So yeah, so you ended up getting your internship with Nes uh, with Visa through Nesby, and like, how was that? Um, the internship or just the Nesby part? Um, the Nesby and the internship. Like, Actually, if, if you could mm -hmm. give people tips on, you know, how you got a, a internship from Nesby. Yeah, yeah. So Nesby was actually amazing. I joined on the whim just because um, I had a couple of other friends that joined that were in computer science. The way the, the UT Austin cha um, Nesby chapter was set, it was more so on the, like, mechanical engineers, the chemical engineers, the petroleum engineers. So there weren't a lot of you know, computer, um, computer science majors that were going there. But we showed up anyways, and it was really cool. That year, we went to Boston, 
And that was super cool. It was cold. It was <laughs> so cold. Because, you know, I'm a Texan. Like, we don't do that. So yeah. I was like, what is this? But yeah. it was worth it. You know, they had all these mixers. It was so cool to see so many black people in a room that's all do the same thing you do when they all look like you. And then also just, just, just like-minded, you know, they're making a lot of money and stuff like that. It was beautiful to see. And then even better to see all these top companies around you too, just looking for talent from people that look like you. It was dope. And then the, the thing that I liked the most, especially as a college person was, you know, all the swag and stuff they give you, they give you like socks, they'll give you like, you know, cup holders and stuff like that. It was really cool. But, um, as far as how I got the visa one, my homegirl Rebecca um, from UT, she actually had interviewed with them, and then she told me to go by that table and check it out too. So I was like, okay, bet. I gave them my resume, and they were like, okay, cool. You know, we're gonna just interview you really quick to see what skills you have, what you've been learning in classes and stuff like that. So they took me back behind this like little divider or something like that on the platform, and it was cool. We were just chit chatting and everything like that. It's um, it's not as informal because it's literally a conference. Like, there's not an actual interview room or anything like that but it was really cool yeah it was great they took it and then like a couple of days later i got a call back and it was from um my hiring manager at the time okay and that was dope how much um, did visa pay you visa paid me i think it was 35 40 an hour 35 40 dollars an hour and you're still in college yes i was still in college and um that was actually how i got into data mm, and i didn't okay. know it at the time so i worked in the hr department and we're doing learning analytics, which is basically like, you know, how are the companies learning and taking all these, you know, courses that we offer them, like, you know, the Safari books, the Harvard Business School, the um, Udemy and all that free stuff that, that companies tend to offer to their employees. We just run metrics to see how that's working and also also to see um, if the employees are even using the licenses that we're buying. Mm. So I did a lot of that. And the thing is, when I joined, it was completely new. So I basically got to help architect to set up that whole department. And it was really cool. So I was doing a mix of data engineering and then also data analytics work. Okay. Okay. So that's how you made that transition from just software to data engineering. Yes. The weird thing about it was I didn't know it was data at the time mm. because I had the role called learning technologist. Yeah. And when I asked what the job description was, my boss, Gordon, he was just like, oh, you know, it's just we're going to be really setting up like some HR learning analytics systems and stuff like that. You're going to be working on a website. It was very vague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was like, Visa looks good for my resume. And uh -huh. This is a great. So, like, just why not? Um, after a while, I got kind of bored with it. Mm -hmm. Just because I was like, why am I not coding every day? Where's the software engineering in this? This yeah. is weird. Um, so, I staked with it, the internship. Then I went to actually do that as my first full-time job out of school. Okay, so you stuck with Visa? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, and it was cool. Um, I think they ended up paying me. Because I was in the HR department, they actually paid me less than the engineers than were in the engineering departments. Mm. So I had to fight for that. They actually were trying to give me like 58K. Whoa. And I was like, no, ma'am, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yeah, no, yeah. No, so they ended up giving me like 70K, 70, 75 at the time. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I can work with this. You know, this gives me some time to just learn more. And then I could just dip whenever I'm ready. I've already technically been here for a year. Because I also continue to work there during the school year after the summer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, at that time, that was pretty much like the going uh, rate for software engineers that weren't at like fame companies. Exactly. It was between like 70, 75K right. for sure. So yeah, that's that's a great starting salary. So um, from there, like how did you start to transition into doing like cloud DevOps? Like how do you make yes. that transition? So yeah, so after a while of getting tired of doing the data stuff that mm -hmm. I didn't know was data, I was like, let me just go look around and see what else is available. So I ended up applying for, well, I mean, what's my current job, but it was a very popular cloud computing company. Mm -hmm. And at first, you know how the hiring managers are. Sometimes they'll list off skills that aren't even necessary for the job. Yep. Um, and I didn't even know that it was supposed to be in the cloud because <laughs> it just said, you know, software engineer role. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, okay, great. So I applied. They were saying, you know, you need some Python, you know, the basic stuff that you need. Python, you know, scripting, mm -hmm. basic stuff. So I was like, okay, let me do that. As soon as I got there, they were like, oh, yeah, you're doing cloud engineering. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I was just way in over my head with it. But yeah. Um, but that's the thing about like software engineering, like when it comes to degrees, and I, I still feel like this, if you do go to school, I think the best degree to get is computer science. You yes. don't need it to get be become a software engineer, but every company knows like, oh, if you were able to get a computer science degree, you can pretty much do anything. Like mm -hmm. we'll throw you in any role and we know you're going to be able to figure it out. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very general purpose degree because mm-hmm. there's so many aspects of tech or so many subfields of tech, technical roles, I would say. And I think that's also why I wanted to jump around a lot because, mm-hmm. you know, I started with the, you know, front end de- development. Then I also did, you know, the Android. Then I went to, you know, the data stuff. And then now I'm over here with the soft- the cloud engineering and the DevOps and all that stuff. Just because you really get to just feel for what you like and want to specialize in. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times you might not like one thing, but you'll like another. That doesn't mean you need to throw out your whole degree. Yeah, or throw out your entire career. Exactly. Because that's what a lot of people do. They get into something. They're like, oh, I don't like this. And they're like, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. There are so many aspects to tech. Like, so many. So you should never really, like, just box yourself in and think, like, oh, since I don't like this one specific position, Mm -hmm. that tech is not for me. A hundred percent. A thousand percent. So yeah, so I started doing the cloud engineering, just working on, there was a key encryption service that we worked on, which is basically just um, you know, protecting your databases, any type of data that you have, so people can't just easily you know, hack into your database and get in. It's mm-hmm. encrypted by a key. Um, so I did that some, for a bit, helped work out an SDK and our CLI and stuff like that for commands and stuff in the terminal. And then our technical writer left. And so I, they were like, do you wanna do technical writing? And I was like, <laughs> I tried. Yeah. So I did. Uh-huh. I did it for six months uh-huh. and um, actually got a, a shout out by the VP for us. We, um, a quantum computing feature that we I did work, work on or write on. Wow. So it was dope. I got kind of bored with that. That's just not my forte. Yeah, yeah. He <laughs> was writing all day. Yes. And yeah. you have to do like this nerdy technical talk and translate it into something that is, you know, basically human readable <laughs> yeah, for like, yeah, you yeah. know, your clients and stuff like mm-hmm. that. It was boring. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad. Um, and we had, we hired on some people who were excellent and talented at that. So luckily that was done. And then that's when they were like, hey, we don't have any DevOps and SRE people. Do you want to work on that? And I said, okay, bet. Because like, why would I not? It's a booming field right now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to pick up those skills. So I did that for the past couple of years. Mind you, this is the same product team. It's just they literally just be having me move around back and forth, back and forth. And that's how it is at a lot of companies, right? And that's why I always tell people, like, it's it's about getting your foot in the door in tech. Mm-hmm. Because these companies and these organizations, they're very large. Mm-hmm. So you get your foot in the door, then you can start to move around. Like mm-hmm. with me at Raytheon, I changed jobs five times at the same oh, company. Yeah, yeah, I was there for seven years. I did five different roles. Mm-hmm. Of them were... Um, all of them, for the most part, I would jump in like organization from organization. Mm-hmm. Um, so Raytheon, they take organizations within their company. They look at it as like separate companies. Mm-hmm. So at some point I had some of the different organizations like fighting over me, trying to mm-hmm. get me. So it's just like it, people got to understand, like focus on getting your foot in the door and then move around from there. You don't have to have everything figured out from your first job. A hundred percent agree. And the thing is, no matter what job you take or how senior you are, you're going to have to learn on the job anyways, because every single company and every team has different processes and tools and procedures that they do. So, you know, you can be a a shining star on one team and, you know, perfect and automate everything there. You might get to another team and they're completely having to start from scratch. And sure, you're like, oh, I can automate this too, but they might be using completely different tools than your last team is. And so you're going to have to learn those. So it's good to learn. Actually, if you didn't have to learn anything, you'd probably be bored. Facts, so, facts. Yeah. So now that you're a, a cloud DevOps and site reliability engineer, like what's your typical day like? Yes. So my typical day. So what we tend to do every two weeks, we'll basically do a new tag or a new release version. And that that process lasts for two weeks. So basically what that is doing is taking all the PRs from all the different repos that we need to put into a new version of the software making sure it's testing and running and make sure it's okay, building it and packaging it. And then what we'll do is actually deploy it onto our systems. It's similar to like an iOS or Android app update, update mm-hmm. where y'all see that come in and you're like, oh, okay, let me just click update on our phone. I'm the, pe- I'm the person that just literally takes all those updates and put them in a file for you to just click and upload on your phone or to, you know, update your phone. Right, right. On your phone or computer or whatever. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So, so for people who aren't familiar with like DevOps, like what is DevOps? If you can like explain it to people, because I haven't had anybody on here yet that's like DevOps or site reliability engineer so like if you could just explain what it is because they might be confused yes yeah. sure it gets confused a lot and mm-hmm. it can be considering the fact that um, i'm a hybrid so it all merges together for me for for devops that's more so deploying and testing new releases mm-hmm. just to make sure everything works perfectly make sure there are no customers that have outages or anything like that so after you do deployments 
or push, you know, the latest code, you just test to make sure, okay, is this code open warning in this region or what about this region? Because every region might have different deployments and things, systems or features that are going on. Also testing to make sure, okay, if let's say 15 million people decide to press this one, one, you know, use this one feature, is this still gonna work? Is this gonna break our infrastructure? Stuff like that for this release. So that's what that is. And then for SRE, Site Reliable Engineer, that is more so um, making sure that you're maintaining the infrastructure on the day-to-day -day just to make sure there are no outages just in general. So a lot of that is um, automating, a lot of updating infrastructure. If you have any virtual machines you're using that host any code, you're updating that. You might need to do some secrets or password rotations as well to make sure no one hacks into the systems. Um, also doing a lot of logging and monitoring too. Okay. This feature is crashing, we need to go in and fix that, but this feature works fine. Stuff like that, it's just a lot of upgrades and just monitoring and, and maintaining of the systems and infrastructure that you have. Okay, and then like, what type of skills do people need to become a DevOps or site reliability engineer? Um, I guess, what type of technical skills do you use on a typical day-to-day? -day? So, to start, automation is a huge thing. So, Bash uh, or Python scripting is really great if you have that. Um, for your logging and monitoring, you're probably going to want to have something like Grafana, Kibana going on. For logging, there might be something like LogDNA. There's a lot of different tools like that, but you definitely need to know logging and monitoring. I know some people use Splunk as well, yep. depending on what job you're at. Um, and then also, of course, let's see what else is there. Oh, Terraform and Ansible. So Terraform and Ansible are software or tools that you use to upgrade and, um, and also just start up your infrastructure. Okay. So those are some good ones. You're going to need some soft skills and stuff like that, too, because you're going to have to talk to your stakeholders or any product managers or even your managers just to explain, hey, we need to upgrade this package because X, Y, Z is going on. This is exactly how it translates to our business requirements. And then also um, this is how it could potentially impact or, you know, impact any new customers or anything like that or might, you know, interfere with our SLAs, our service level agreements, which means, oh, at any given time we will only have um, the service down for X, Y, and Z minutes before we can get fined or before we break our contract with um, clients that state that we are reliable. Right, right. Yeah, so um, for people to learn those skills, like, do you do you have any recommendations for people to learn, like, let's bash shell scripting or Python or any of, like, the automation um, uh, technologies? Or, like, did you learn everything on the job? So I learned everything on the job, um, but as far as how you can learn el elsewhere, of course, you know, I would go pick up a cloud cert or either just, even if you don't get the cert, mm -hmm. just go look at the course curriculum from like a Udemy course or something for like cloud AWS DevOps or, you know, same thing with GCP, stuff like that. Yeah. Code Academy is great too, just for learning the basics of Python and bash scripting too. Um, I'm the type of person that always wants to get the most for the least. Yeah. So YouTube University is always where I tell people to go to just to get the basics, just to understand. And then once you're ready to take it to the next level, Udemy course or, you know, Coursera or something like that. But I do recommend the cloud, some type of cloud education, just because that's where a lot of, um, a lot of companies are shifting to, mm -hmm. or even if they aren't doing a pure cloud, it's like a hybrid, a hybrid cloud situation. Yeah, yep. yeah, definitely. Definitely. Like I, I try to explain to people that like the AWS, uh, CCP certification is not going to get you a job, but if you start to take it like a step further, maybe you look at solutions, architect, DevOps, the security, um, mm -hmm. AWS certifications that can help you get a job because it shows you have like more specialized skills. Cause mm -hmm. the AWS CCP is just more kind of like understanding all of the different services that AWS offers yes. and understanding how the billing works and like shared security responsibility and things like that. Right. I a hundred percent agree with that. That's your basic foundation level cert, mm -hmm. just to say you understand what this cloud service does. But when you were to get something that's more technical or role-based, you want to go for those, like, like we say, those role-based certs. That helps you to actually get better understanding of what you would do on a day-to-day -day inside of that role. You know, you're not going to have a, a, um, a client that's like, oh, what service did I use to go do X, Y, and Z? Yeah. That's not what that is. You have, they'll be like, no, you know, we're trying to spin up X, Y, and Z service. How could you help us? What do we need? What's the pricing points across all these different plans? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. And that CCP is not going to teach you that. It's going to be whatever role-based cert it is. Like, of course, if you're doing the DevOps or, you know, something like data engineering or any of those other certs that are more technical or more skills or role-specific.
Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, like, once you got into doing, um, like, DevOps and site reliability reliability engineer roles, it's a a tongue twister a little bit. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, once you started getting into those roles, like, what type of salaries did you start getting there? So those, especially when you... I mean, for, especially when you get the mid-level and stuff like mm-hmm. that, it's easy to come across, like, you know, 140K plus for those types of roles. Yeah. Um, entry level, you're still, DevOps, really, if it was me, I would not touch anything, like, less than, like, 90K just to, if you're entry level starting out with no technical background or anything like that, just yeah. because of how in demand it is. Mm. What type um, of demand do you, like, have when you work in DevOps? Like, what's the work balance? Are you, like, on call? I've heard people are on call so, and stuff. So, yeah, when it comes to DevOps and SRE, there is a high chance of you being on call just because, like we said, we're managing the infrastructure of um, the service. And then also when you're releasing new features or anything like that, you want to make sure all regions aren't impacted. And mind you, even if you're U.S. based, you might have regions in like literally Madrid, like Spain or either like Japan or something like that. So if those people are impacted, you have to wake up in the middle of the night to go handle that. And that can interfere with whatever plans if you're trying to go party, shoot, even sleep. So you do have to be ready for that. And the amount of times you'll have to be on call depends on the team. The team I'm on, we literally go on call for one week every like three to four months. But I actually recently had an interview for another SRE role where they literally had you have a call one day a week. And mm. I was like, no, I can't do that. That's, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, that's that's not, like for you, it's not a good like work, work-life work balance. Mm-mm. Yeah. No, yeah, and I'm trying to be on call as least as possible just because <laughs> I've been there, done that for years. So, and then depending on how small your team is, even if you're not DevOps or SRE, but you're in a cloud, you might have to be on call anyway. It's just because the team is that small. Mm, yeah, definitely. So, so like, for people who want to do these kind of roles, like, how, how do you, like, balance that work-life balance with being on call? So, like I said, it just, that's the first question or one of the questions that you need to ask within that initial interview that you have with whatever hiring manager or person that knows more so about the day-to-day of the team. So, to, that way you'll be able to balance it. So, for me, like I said, I didn't have to go on call. I only went on call one week every few months. So that week, that would be my like lay low week or either you just have to take your laptop and you put it in the backpack and take it with you. Um, it can get hectic and it also just depends on how tight your security is and also your troubles, um, troubleshooting and incident management is with your team. Mm-hmm. Some teams are really kind of messy, they don't really have anything automated so it takes forever to find something. If like a pager duty alert goes off and they're like, oh, this happened and you're like, oh, well, I don't know where to search for this. Some people just don't have that going or the, um, the automation there. Mm-hmm. Luckily for like the team that I worked on in the past, it's oh, you know, this is what's happening. This is the service, the microservice that's happening. This is a line, and we have run books as well to show how to, you know, troubleshoot whatever's going on. So really, you just have to base it off of your team, and then also just how many incidents that occur typically on a day to day. So yeah, so how has tech impacted like any other aspects of your life, like you know, family life at home, stuff like that. So I think that tech actually has afforded me to be able to have a great family life because of, you know, remote work and then also, well, most recently hybrid. So I'm actually a mother of an almost two-year-old. She's amazing. But um, I'm, and you know, for a lot of moms, they want to be able to both, you know, be a mom as much as possible while also working as well to, you know, help provide for the family. So for me... I feel really grateful because I really struggled at first with like, oh, I don't want to have her to go to daycare. I want her to stay home with me. Mm. Well, after maternity leave, I was actually able to do that for a bit. I think for like a good like six months, she was staying at home with me while I was working. But I was remote and it worked out because time management was great for me. I I finally got a grasp on that as far as, you know, her schedule. Okay, well, she's going to be napping during this time. I need to feed her during this time. I might need to pump. So let me do that at this time. But also in between meetings and stuff like that. I also have a team who was big on family life, too. A lot mm-hmm. of the people were um, older, so they already had kids and stuff like that, and they knew what the expectations were of just being a first-time mom and then also just of having kids. So that's really great. So she started daycare recently about, like, a month or so ago, and that's okay. actually been really lovely because I have to start going into the office two, three times a week. But it mm. works out well. I actually get to pick her up early, like around three, which is I'm really grateful for that because of how flexible my schedule can be. And then also, like I said, time management with getting tasks and stuff done. So I actually get to have her 
or see her more often than, you know, like most typical people would where, you know, you have to come in after work six, seven and get them and, you know, by that time it's time to put them in bed. Yeah. So I still get some time to still play with her and everything like that. And when she goes to bed, I can just finish up a couple of hours, you know, my day or for whatever work and it's done. Um, also, you know, I have more time, especially from working home sometimes where I get to just make her food and her lunch for her mm -hmm. and it's fresh, you know, it feels really great to be able to do those types of things and have that time and then also the money to be able to afford to do that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, I, I feel like that's the best thing about tech, especially because now like we have remote hybrid, things like that. Um, a lot of people don't. I don't think they understand it. Like a lot of people are very flexible, right? Like mm -hmm. everybody knows, like everybody has a family life. You need work-life balance. So that's really good that you're able to, you know, take care of your family and then still be able to get work done and not feel like, oh, you know, I got to, I got to sacrifice and choose between one or the other. Right. Exactly. And, um, and that's, yeah, like you said, that flexibility tech, as far as what you want out of it is up to you. You know, if you're doing contracts, if you're doing pure contracts, you set your own hours and stuff like that depending on, you know, exactly what those contracts entail. If you're working from home, I mean, once again, you're setting your own schedule. If you yeah. want to go out and go do something, go exercise, go to the gym, whatever, you can do all that because it's all there. And then um, also, like you said, you know, if your team is cool and stuff like that with, you know, other outside obligations, that stuff is fine as well. You don't have to be glued or stuck to a keyboard for like 12 hours at a time unless of course you have impending deadlines coming up and stuff like that but there's just a lot like you said a lot of flexibility to do whatever you want and to make your life whatever it is like if you want to go traveling you can go do that too and work remotely right so, yeah have you have you ever done any like contract roles yes yes I how have. was that so it's actually been great so I do data a lot of data roles mm -hmm. on um, through contracts that's like my night job I like to call it yeah data architecture and data engineering is what I do so I think the first time I actually got into this was Charles Schwab. They reached out to me, I think a year or so into me being like a cloud engineer because they saw my work with Visa. Yeah. And they actually wanted to- I remember to, when you started working with them. Yeah. And they actually wanted to help me or help them stand up their learning analytics department. That's so, crazy. And they saw because I have literally that direct experience that I could be perfect. And that was really crazy for me because the JD said you need at least eight years of experience. Yeah. And I was there literally like a year and a half or something like that. Yeah. So like, let's talk about that. How like job descriptions will say one thing and then like what you're actually doing or what actually is required will say a whole nother thing. So um, I said that recently that a lot of people they end up putting themselves out of the race before they mm -hmm. even actually apply to the job, right? Like they'll go look at a job description and they'll tell themselves, oh no, I'm not qualified. I need to do mm -hmm. this. I need more experience. I need to have this. Mm -hmm. I need this certification. When in actuality, you don't need that stuff. Like you yeah. might already have all the skills that are needed and the job description is just a formality. If they feel like you can do the job, it doesn't matter how many years of experience. It doesn't matter what requirements they put on there. They're going to give you the job. Facts, facts. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of people, yeah, like you say, they cheat themselves out or take themselves out of the race before even letting somebody, you know, else kick them out. So a lot of, I know, entry level people, they struggle with finding roles because everything says five to seven years, five to seven years, three to five years, something like that. Those aren't hard requirements. In fact, if I, for me, especially in the beginning, when I was first starting, anything that had anything from like one to five years of experience, I just applied for those anyways, just because a lot of times it's the hiring manager that's setting these, um, that's doing these JDs, and they don't actually know what's going on or what's needed for the role itself. They just need something for HR so they can just submit it and go on. So just apply. Um, also, a lot of the skills that are listed in tools and stuff like that, half the time these companies don't even be using those or even have it like set up in their infrastructure. Mm. I remember one time somebody was like, yeah, we need a GCP expert. And I was like, do y'all have GCP? Like what services are y'all using? Oh, we're thinking about doing it. Like we haven't actually done anything yet. We're in the talks. Well, then why do you have that listed on there? You're thinking about it. You haven't even <laughs> signed a contract. Yeah. And they didn't even use, they ended up not going with GCP. So just I, I always say if you know at least a few skills on there even if 40 percent at this point just apply for it anyways and then don't let the years of experience deter you the worst thing that can happen is they just reject you mm -hmm. or they might just have you come on because they like you so much and they also see that you're willing to learn and to grow with the team and that's actually a um underrated component when it comes to interviewing and also applying a lot of people want to work with enjoyable people and people that actually like to learn those are those soft skills. Those soft skills. Those are the soft skills clutch. that the people online don't want to talk about. They're like, you got to be super technical or you won't ever make money. No, you can have soft skills. You need to be likable. They mm -hmm. might, they got to want to work with you. 
and mm-hmm. that gets you like half the way there i yes. feel like especially yep especially if you sweeten and butter people up in interviews <laughs> you can you can have like half the questions wrong but if they really like you and it shows that you're really an enjoyable person to be around and you also just show that you know you're not you're just laid back and you you actually want to learn they're more excited to take you on than somebody who knows all the answers and just you know knows the right questions and yada 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 it's just like you really and you won't know until you actually like try it that's why i really recommend those soft skills for real yeah i you know i see people they tell me in my comments all the time they're like i'm looking for jobs and all i see is is roles that require three to five years of experience mm-hmm. and i'm like I agree with you. To me, anything that's under four years is is entry, in my opinion, mm-hmm. because just like you said, you don't really know if those are the skills they actually are looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm not going to lie. A lot of people aren't really looking for roles like that. Their LinkedIn's aren't updated. Their resumes aren't updated and optimized. Mm-hmm. So like when you get all that stuff optimized, the recruiter should start reaching out to you. Yes. That's when you know you're on the right track. Once the recruiters reach out to you. And that's actually what happened with Charles Schwab. I mm-hmm. wasn't in the market for anything. And they reached out to me and it was like, hey, your LinkedIn pro- profile fixed exactly what we're looking for. And it was simple. I did like two interviews with them or something, blew them out of the water to where even the other much more senior candidates that they were looking for didn't even, you know, they didn't even make it. And this was a literal, this was a data architect position. This wasn't even like a data analyst engineer. It was an architect position. It's a senior. And they wanted me to be the one to create the roadmap for their entire infrastructure, for their learning analytics program. So that was huge. And just with me having my, what, two years of experience? So wow. It's so, possible. <laughs> wow, that's that's crazy. That's crazy. So so you were able to do that contract and like so you do those at the same time right now. Like what skills do you use? Mm-hmm. I remember at that time you were looking at like Tableau and stuff like that. I was telling you I was mm-hmm. like because a lot of people sleep on Tableau. It's like you you learn Tableau and you make those dashboards and they look really well and you can explain mm-hmm. it. You can make like I've seen people charge up to like three hundred dollars an hour. Yeah, you can really make a lot of money just from Tableau alone, um, especially as you like you said when you you're dashboards make sense because mm-hmm. a lot of people think that you use tableau just to build these pretty dashboards yeah when in reality it's not about the dashboard being pretty it's about it being understandable and also helping the, the your execs your stakeholders to understand where to cut costs and what to do to make more money that's what they're focused on they're not like oh the color scheme is so pretty we're just gonna <laughs> hire you know this is great you know here's a promotion no it's oh okay we're not hitting these metrics thank you for showing us that we need to go focus on x y and z or oh Revenue was down in X, Y, Z. Let me go run and talk to the marketing department to figure out what we can do. Things like that that actually show and prove that, you know, what you're doing is valuable. And I think that's why a lot of people have dashboards that either, you know, they're there for a bit, people use it, and then like a month or a quarter later it falls off and no one uses it again. You have Mm -hmm. to make sure that your dashboards provide actionable insights. And then it's just even more so, it's more than just the numbers, it's even yourself. Those soft skills, like I said, you're showing the dashboard, but you're also helping the, the stakeholders and stuff himself to say, give ideas. Say, yeah. oh, you need to go do this X, Y, and Z too. Or have you thought about doing this? Or, you know, do you also need to provide input and stuff like that? It's not just creating a dashboard with somebody who gave you a data set. You yeah. know, show that you actually know how to provide extra value outside of just building a dashboard. And that's what actually sets like a, you know, the entry level to like mid level to senior data analyst apart mm. when they're able to talk to those stakeholders and actually provide input on what to do next. But that also requires business acumen. Yeah. And that one's also super underrated for data analysts. A lot of people think that, oh, it's just like I said, data set, dashboard. But no, do you understand the key trends that are happening in the industry? Do you understand, you know, what, you know, typical metrics are that, you know, the business runs on and also how they're making money? What, you know, what forecasting should be looking at? Oh, yeah, I see this trend is happening. Maybe we should look at the trend over that's adjacent. That might blow up too. Stuff like that. And a lot of that takes experience and then also knowing what to look for. A lot of times that's really just you looking at um, the tools that you're working for, like Tableau. They have a lot of business use cases on their website. Okay. Go filter down by the industry that you're working in. Look at those use cases to see how those companies are using Tableau to make money and then figure out how to do that for your own company. Mm. 
Okay, that's a that's an amazing tip because a lot of people are interested in data, but they don't really know where to go with it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I feel like a lot of people are thinking about just the data analyst role. And with AI and everything, mm-hmm. I strongly suggest people look at like becoming a data engineer, mm-hmm. not just a data analyst. And the engineering is, is the part that comes in where you're making the dashboards, giving insights, telling mm-hmm. a story. Um, and making recommendations. So since you've been able to do like software engineering, DevOps, SRE, data engineering, all of that, right? Like what do you think actually helped you the most (laughs) to get all of these different skills and get all these different roles? So it sounds crazy, but I think it's just, again, my willingness to learn Mm -hmm. um, and just to see, I've worked in all those roles long enough to see how they all encompass each other and how it all makes sense to help a business generate revenue or even just to, you know, retain their customers and stuff like that. And that's why I talked about earlier in a video about how, um, about how it takes time. It takes time to understand all the skills and things that you need and how everything works together. That's why it takes years. I've jumped in all these different roles just to try and make sense of everything. It all fits together like a puzzle. Mm. But because I have all those skills, of course, it makes me extremely valuable because I can jump from one, you know, one role to the next one seamlessly just because I know how everything fits together and I know the different skills. That's not to say that you need to do that. I'm just crazy and I just like trying different things. And yeah. I also just like being valuable. I'm a jack of all trades. But um, but yeah, like I said, that willingness to grow and learn is really what sets you apart and make you valuable and will make you stand out more than like even a person with like that's highest higher seniority applying for the same role. Mm, okay okay so since you're like really business minded i know you invest as well right so we don't really ever talk about investing much on here but i want to try to start talking more about it Mm -hmm. so like like what did you do with with your tech money you know i know you have a baby now Mm -hmm. i know you've been investing like what what do you do with your money to like make it grow and just start to build that wealth for you and your family yeah, sure. So my first investment was actually um, a duplex in mm. Hutto, Texas. That's mm-hmm. like on the outskirts of Austin. Um, and I chose to go on the outskirts because, of course, property values or, you know, the, the cost of homes here in Austin is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it was ridiculous back then. It's even more ridiculous now. So I'm just like, let me look on the outskirts because that's, you know, where it's underrated. People are going to start eventually shifting outside or shifting from inside the um, city to outside just because it's cheaper and they also get like a bank, more bang for their buck basically. And that worked out. So I got the duplex. I got really lucky, got basically grandfathered in with a tenant on one side who stayed there for years. They actually are still there. They actually, they moved out, their kids moved in. Oh wow. Yeah, so yeah, so they've been <laughs> That's there. real generational. Yes, and I'm grateful that I've been that good of a landlord to where they they just want to stay and keep renewing their lease every year. That's great. That's it's really great. Um actually, I stayed in the other side of the duplex. Yeah. But then when um the kids moved in, I got kicked out cuz they needed a bigger crib cuz they had a baby. Oh, okay. So I left and then the um the smaller unit actually ended up um letting someone else come. Mm-hmm. They ended up breaking their lease early, but their uncle came and stayed. So and, not a whole family in there? Yeah. Um <laughs> but that that's a completely separate family. Oh, but okay. I got really lucky with him because he gave me the um a year's rent up front. Oh, wow. You know, it's crazy because usually when they be like, oh, well, I'm going to pay the rent up front, it usually be a scam. Mm-hmm. But no. he, it was legit. Yes. Yeah, so he's an older man. Like, he just he like, I don't do want to make himself. no monthly payments. Yeah. Here's everything up front. Exactly. He owns his own business. He just wants to mind his business, lay and be chill. Yeah. Wow. So I got really lucky with him. He renewed again. Not mm. all, He didn't pay all up front, but he still paid on time. So yeah. I'm grateful. Wow, that's that's amazing. So I know you were doing like mobile home investing too, but <sighs> did you, you sold your mobile homes, right? Yes. Yes, luckily. That was <laughs> so that was a disaster for me, but I actually learned a lot from it. Mm-hmm. Um so I actually purchased two mobile homes from a, um an older guy who actually owns he has like at least a thousand mobile homes he, wow. he had mm-hmm. and he was just selling those two off because one the person that ran off and he didn't want it. They were just older homes, so yeah. he didn't want them anymore. So I got them for 10k. Each or yes. total? Yes, um, total. Oh, so wow. So I got them both for 10K. One was a 3-2, the other one was a 2-2. Pretty decent. Mm-hmm. I ended up, what I did mess up on was going a little bit all too in on them as oh, far okay. as fixing them up. I made them look extremely nice, which is not bad. Yeah. It's just that when it comes to being an investor, you have to know what, like, what touches to do without yeah. you getting, you know, 
burning your profit basically right right so that's what happened yeah at some point they those homes look nicer than what i was staying in like they had the marble countertops and all that stuff like that it was nice and wow i really like repainted everything it was beautiful but what ended up burning me was just being too nice when it came to screening tenants mm -hmm. one of them um i kind of gave them a chance they had like a um that basically i shouldn't have taken them in but they ended up not being really good people and the kitchen ended up they let the kitchen grow mold in there without telling me oh. so it became inhabitable yeah so and i was like i can't have y'all I'm, I'm, my, my ethics and morals won't allow me to just have y'all in here yeah the mom is pregnant there's also young kids running around like i'm gonna have to have y'all like go and you, you didn't tell me that there was mold growing yeah and it wasn't like a small like it was just it was a lot it was obvious mm -hmm. like there was no way that you should not have said something to me about yeah. this some tenants are like that they just won't say anything and i was like, like why? why you ain't call me <laughs> right, because exactly, and yeah. then also they weren't paying their rent or anything like that, so I ended up having to evict them. Mm -hmm. That was bad. They got really upset. They ripped pipes out of the um, out of the walls. They oh, like man. slashed the doors and stuff like that. They literally like had feces in the toilet. It just left it like that, and like it was, they just trashed the place. It was really upsetting. Mm. And then the other people, they just, um, they just gave me a hard time about everything. Yeah. They were just a tenant. Oh, can you fix this? Can you fix that? Can you fix that? And it's like there's nothing to fix. You're right, just right. complaining. Yeah, trying to get free rent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's literally what it was. They didn't even want to pay the trash fee that the city comes to, to, to like the, pick the up city. the trash. Yeah. Right. But yeah, so I ended up, once I got those tenants out, I ended up just selling them off just to get some type of, just to recoup some of my money. Mm -hmm. I recoup like maybe one fifth of it. Okay. Which was better than nothing. Yeah. Um, and luckily it didn't burn a hole in my wallet, but that's because I also had the contracts going on. Yeah. And I just made sure as an invest, um, as an investor just to have savings. Yeah, so definitely. So it didn't burn me too bad. It was just an emotional stress that they put me through. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's it. Um, but that's lessons learned. I definitely do want to get some more duplexes in the future, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah. Austin, Austin real estate is crazy. That's my one regret. When I moved out here to work at Fort yes. Hood, I don't know why I didn't buy like a duplex or triplex mm -hmm. or something. And it would have been closer to Fort Hood anyway. Exactly. Because so, I was living over kind of close by the domain. That's right. So I was like, I, I don't know what I was thinking. And it was 2020, like prime. It was prime time. I could have bought something, low interest rate, still had it today. Still be good. We, but you live and you learn, yep. you know, but now for me, what, how I look at it is every single place that I go to, I buy property and then I worry about what I'm going to do with it later. Mm -hmm. But I always keep in mind that like, this is going to be an investment at mm -hmm. some point in the future. Oh yes, absolutely. And then like, you know, the home, I know a lot of people are like, no, you need to have profit now or just get returns now. But I look, I always think long-term about the house appreciation and stuff like that. Yeah. Especially for me. Cause I'm going to, that duplex, I plan to, um, at least pass down, or if I do like sell it or something like that, to pass off the proceeds from that to my child. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you can hold that forever. Exactly, <laughs> and it's already appreciated like a lot. I'm a, sure. A lot. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not you can say, hold that it's forever. A lot. I'm not gonna say, but yeah. So I was like, oh, I'm keeping this. I you haven't. I have investors hitting me up like at least once a month. Like, you gonna sell your property? You gonna yeah. sell your property? I'm like, no. Like, if you want it, that means it's valuable. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna keep it. Yeah. yeah yeah that's dope so any other like investments or you just stocks and savings stuff like that yeah stock savings you know um in your crypto group yeah make a cute little couple of runs there uh -huh. here and there yeah definitely need to join sls if y'all can y'all it's amazing yes um, yes <laughs> so yeah that's basically it i'm trying to go back into crypto some more i'm glad that i left i had some solana and some bitcoin and i left it you and left it alone? Yeah, I left it. So I'm glad I did. Because oh, especially, yeah. you know, that last, yeah, I was like, I don't know about uh, this. And now I'm like. Yeah, now it's nice. Now yeah, it's nice. Exactly. Bitcoin, whew, Bitcoin on the way to six figures. Yeah. Solano on the way to hopefully 500. Yeah, fingers <laughs> crossed. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So so um, since you've been in tech, like since college and you've mm -hmm. been able to make so much money, you've been saving, investing, you know, like how has tech changed your life? Oh, tech has changed my, it's a, oh man, <laughs> I think that tech has changed my life so much that y'all wouldn't have known what I've been through by just by what I look like. Um, Cause like I said, grew up in the hood, like, like hood proper. Um, but like I said, now I'm just very grateful. I mean, I, I got my Porsche. Yep. That, yeah. And this is, it was a I know, I remember you wanted it. Yeah. yeah congrats. Yeah. And I was super happy about that. I feel grateful that I don't have to worry. Just even just, you know. I don't have to worry about checking my bank account for certain things, just like basic um, 
life needs as far as like you know rent utilities you know car payments house payments and stuff like that it's really amazing if i want to go take a vacation right now to a nice place you know i can without having to worry about it if i want to go work remotely i could go get a job that works remotely Mm -hmm. like right now it's just a choice to work hybrid Mm. um and i know for a fact that i could get a job just because of my skill set and how you know how valuable i am in the market um, just, just grateful for that. You know, my child, she's growing up much better than I did. Um, and I enjoy seeing that and just her not having to ha- worry about those stressors, you know, that could happen from the day to day. She just gets to run around and be happy and free and whatever. She don't even know how good she has it. <laughs> that's a blessing. <laughs> and that, and that's what we do it for, right? Exactly. And that's why I started this whole series is because I want people to know that even though we didn't start out with money, you mm-hmm. know, you can get into tech, live a great life. Um, start investing, start saving your money, and then set your yourself up and your future generations up. A hundred percent agree. A yeah. thousand percent agree. Um, yeah, and then oh, lastly, especially as a woman, just having your own and being just that valuable and being able to take care of yourself and not have to worry about how to make ends meet helps exponentially. You know, as women, we're not supposed to. For me, I'm always like, we're not supposed to be overworking ourselves or anything like that. Tech allows you to not have to overwork yourself, but you're still getting paid very well to where you can maintain yourself. You know, go shopping, go have fun, do whatever it is that you need to do, while also still getting to rest. You know, whatever. What is that? It's part of like that little soft life trend that's going on or something like that. Oh, you like living that. the soft life? Yeah, just okay. something like that. I'm working more and more towards it. You know, mm-hmm. having routines set up and stuff like that to where it just don't feel like I'm rushed 24 seven. I just get to almost go with the flow i mean you know life is life you're definitely going to have some ups and downs but as far as just relaxing and just you know living good it's much easier with tech yeah no definitely so i always ask this question before wrapping up the Mm -hmm. show uh what's one piece of advice that you can give people to get to where you are today oh yes okay i actually have a couple of things but um one be bold be bold go after whatever it is that you want and even if you don't reach exactly there at least you're better off than where you started um especially when it comes to applying for jobs and and just just trying to get to where you want to go somebody tells you no say okay and go somewhere else or either just prove them wrong and then it's not even about them it's just more so proving to yourself that you are who you say you are who you want to be that's the biggest thing and that's also how you build confidence by those small steps that you take that move toward move you towards who you say you want to be and who you envision yourself as just keep doing that number two keep going um excuse me but yeah keep going um things get hard you know life is life there's always going to be up and ups and downs just keep trying to do whatever you can to just be one percent better each day three keep your word if you say you go do something just go ahead and do it and that's i don't say that more so to you with keeping your word to other people it's just to yourself Um, And then also, just stop trying to trick yourself out of your own spot. I say a lot of this because you see the, oh, you know, the market is saturated or, oh, AI is going to take our jobs. Just like, why? Just why? The money's always going to be there. You go on LinkedIn every time and search. We we know you do. To see there's so many jobs that are there every day, day after day after day. Mm -hmm. Why are you saying it's not saturated? (laughs) It's just you need to make sure you're doing what you need to do to stand out. As B said, if your LinkedIn is not optimized, if your resume is not optimized, if you just have a generic resume, of course no one's going to pick you. There's also 500 other people with the same resume. Show off your skills, even if it's not, even if you're applying for a job that you didn't, um, that you don't have technical skill, the skills in to do. Like let's say you're going from like HR, you know, working in HR department to you know technical role or you know project management or something like that. Talk about the skills that are adjacent or very similar to, um, in a previous role to the role that you're trying to get into. Um, if you are trying to, I get one for me, I always say in my consultations is like, let's say that you did work in the HR department, you want to move into data analyst work. Go apply in the, the industry for the role that you want. So HR data analyst, go find that. Mm. You will have a good chance because you have the business acumen there and you already know what it's like to talk to people and stakeholders and stuff like that. The only thing that's left for you to do is to get the technical skills. And once you get those technical skills, you just build a dashboard or whatever it is that you're working on. So build an HR dashboard, you know, where you're talking about talent acquisition. There's many people transitioned over. This is the skills that we need from the top candidates and stuff like that. Talent retention, all that stuff. You just literally take what you know and use it um, and put it into technical projects or, you know, non-technical, depending on whatever job you're trying to go into. 
But yeah, stop, just literally, like I said, stop trying to trick yourself out your spot and be serious with yourself. A lot of people say they want things, but in reality, they don't want to put in the work to do it. Mm. Seeing a lot of that lately. Yeah. A lot of people, they, they see, you know, where people are who have been in tech for 5, 10, 15 plus years. Mm -hmm. And once things get hard, they're like, oh, no, nah, you know, it's not for me. Like, you really need to be serious. Like, if you want to get into tech, you need to be serious. You need to put in the hours. You need to put in the work. And just understand that it is going to be a grind. Mm -hmm. It is a grind. It, it definitely is a grind. And you're going to continue to grind because, as we say, it's all, all of it's a learning process. No matter what job you have, whatever company you go to, whatever team, it's all about learning. But who would want to be stagnant anyways? You know, that's when life gets boring. So, yeah, we just definitely play hard over here, but it's definitely work hard, too. And especially when you're first starting out and getting wrapped up, it's going to be a lot of working more hard than you are playing hard. But that's just the game, right? It's that delayed gratification that makes everything worth it. Mm. Well, that's a bar. You gave them a bunch of different gems that they could go <laughs> back and listen to. So thank you so much, Kiera, for coming out. Where can people find you at if they want to, you know, find you on LinkedIn or find your website or Instagram, wherever you are? Yeah, yeah. So you can find me across all platforms minus TikTok because I'm not on there yet at um, I am Kiera D. Um, yeah. You can find me on all the other platforms. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you so much, Kiara. So that wraps up another episode of Day in My Tech Life. My name is Simone B, also known as Bees. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to hit the notification bell. We'll see you on the next one.